for joining us today for our weekly streamed message from the Omimi Baptist Church. We count it a privilege to welcome new friends, especially in these days of challenge for everybody. Today's message, following the celebration of Pentecost last Sunday, focuses on keeping the sacred fire burning. We invite you to participate in this time together in your own way as you engage with us. Some people like to hum along with the tunes, the hymns, Others like to speak aloud the words that are on the screen, or even to sing along. Thanks so much for joining us, and may God bless you. I'd like to invite you to consider making some kind of a contribution to a ministry of your choice. This is a great opportunity to consider giving something back to society to help reach out to the needs of those who are hurting. You might know of a ministry or an organization that cares about needs that you are passionate about. I'm suggesting that you might reach right now for your wallet or your purse and make a commitment about how much you would like to give in appreciation for all that you have and all that I have, of course, and in consideration of those who are less fortunate. Even a small gift is much better than no gift at all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you who care about all humanity and you who provide for our daily needs, thank you for health and strength, for food and clothing, for homes and loved ones. Thank you for our many blessings. Please give us some guidance towards a practical kindness that we can offer to somebody or an organization that we can help as they care for those who are less fortunate. In Christ's name, amen.
This letter of Paul is addressed to one of his loyal helpers called Timothy, who appears to have been struggling to keep the sacred flame burning brightly in his own life. Paul offers him words of encouragement while urging him forward in his daily walk with Christ. Now, before we read, let us pray together for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. O Holy Spirit, your ministry among us includes taking the word of life and breaking it apart before our eyes, revealing to us wonderful truths with eternal importance. Give us today eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that understand, but also hands and feet that are willing to obey. In Christ's name, amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and following. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he great gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard onto that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Hello, this is Pastor Gordon Finlay, and our theme today is Keeping the Sacred Flame Alive Within Us. It was in Greek mythology that it was said that Prometheus brought fire into the world of humans. Fire has been an important part of human culture since very early times. It is sometimes said that humans are inclined to fear or to worship what they don't understand. Now, I understand that a people group known as the Zoroastrians were known to be fire worshippers and perhaps many others too. Fire has always had its practical uses, one of which has been to clear away vegetation and increase land fertility. A roaring bonfire also keeps wild animals away at night from the campfire, allowing the humans to sleep in relative safety, and it can also control pests and parasites. And fires used to be built inside of caves to clear the cave of occupants before humans might set up their dwelling in the inside. Fires were lit to corral and trap animals for hunting. And it's said that social life around the home hearth has been credited with the development of language and with extending and modifying what we call the internal clock of humans, upsetting their circadian rhythms, which used to operate between sunrise and sunset. 
So yes, fire has had a long and important history with many practical uses and benefits, as well as the fascination that it seems to have had over individuals. In recent messages, we spoke about some of the symbols that God used in association with his presence and activity among human creatures. Fire, cloud, the mighty wind, and the pouring as with water or oil for anointing. Jesus had promised his followers that they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire, which we considered last Sunday at Pentecost, because at that time supernatural fire appeared among those disciples as they were gathered together in the upper room, and the individual flames or tongues separated and rested upon each person who was present. Now, with this coming of the Holy Spirit, they also received power and spoke miraculously in other tongues or languages understood by the many visitors who were visiting Jerusalem from other parts of the known world. In summary, their hearts and souls were touched by this sacred flame from above. And fire was now burning on the altar of their hearts, the fire of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts tells us how the Lord used the Apostle Peter to bring this wonderful reality of the Holy Spirit to the Gentile people at Cornelius the Centurion's home in Caesarea. Acts 10 tells us that they too, as Gentiles, received this same Holy Spirit as the Jewish believers, speaking in other tongues or languages miraculously. It also tells us that Paul, who was a former Pharisee and persecutor of the Christians, himself received the Holy Spirit and was used by the Lord to bring former disciples of John the Baptist into a full experience of the Holy Spirit. You read about it in the 19th chapter of Acts. He placed his hands upon them. They too received the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues or languages. So, I think we can safely say that it was the normative experience for these Christian believers to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire, and as I said a few moments ago, that the sacred flame of the Holy Spirit burned on the altar of their hearts. God had started that wonderful holy fire in their hearts and souls. But it is also the responsibility of the Christian believer to do our part to keep that fire burning by the grace of God. In our scripture reading today, Paul urges his friend Timothy to fan into a blaze the gift of God within him. It seems that Timothy may have been troubled by fear and timidity, and that what he really needed to do was to exercise spiritual authority that over anything that was restricting his spiritual life. We know that fear does not come from God, so we are safe in saying that Satan was trying to oppress and restrict Timothy's spiritual life. And scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Have you ever wondered what Paul must have expected Timothy to do in order to fan this smoldering spiritual gift into a flame? And we may ask the same question for ourselves. What about us? You see, affluence and ease in our modern world can cause us to become spiritually dull and sleepy. And our very busy lives can also sometimes choke out the very best efforts that we want to make. Temptation can cause us to lose our way. Discouragement and seasons of spiritual dryness can begin to deepen their roots into your life and into mine. And the result is that the flame begins to burn low. Now, as an example, let's think together about what happens in a marriage when both partners let the flame of romance burn low, or when the spark of respect and mutual appreciation doesn't fire anymore, when neglect has its way. In the early days of the Christian church at Ephesus, the Christian believers were dynamos of spiritual life and missionary service. As the years passed, nobody seemed to notice that as the torch of faith was passed to a new generation, something was missing, something sinister had begun to happen. Many may call it second-generation syndrome, in which the fruit of the Holy Spirit was not being produced quite as before. People became preoccupied with their own matters and ignored the needs of others. Their community of faith began to suffer and their spiritual fervor declined. Now, maybe they forgot, maybe they ceased to care about the warning of Jesus. 
Jesus had said that the love of many would wax cold, especially because of public acceptance of sin and iniquity. John's letter to the church at Ephesus, recorded in the book of Revelation, gives them a spiritual checkup and tells them that they have neglected their first love. Just as a motor car needs regular maintenance and care, so also your faith and mine need and deserve our attention. Our first love for God involves putting Him first in our daily lives, thanking Him for providing in Christ a salvation that we can never produce on our own, we could never have engineered it ourselves. We love Him who first loved us. And this first love for God always overflows into love for other people that He has created. When we allow ourselves to enlarge and squeeze others out of the picture, of course, our spiritual life and our spiritual flame is affected. So there are two things that I would like us to take away from this passage today. The first part is that we do have responsibility in our own lives that once we receive this spiritual life from God, we are to cooperate and keep the flame burning in our lives. We need to give particular attention to feeding and caring for and protecting the flame of faith in our lives and in our hearts. Listening to God speak through his word, talking to God in prayer, those are just a few of the things that in fact are our responsibility, our side of the equation. I believe we can also need to feed and care for and protect the flame of hope in our spiritual lives. Hope is described as a confident expectation. I also believe that we need to guard and protect grace in how we deal with other people in our lives and things that come into our daily lives. Grace involves patience and gentleness and understanding, especially with those kinds of people who seem not to deserve it at all. So the one responsibility is for protecting the flame of faith in our own lives, and the other is, what should we do for our sister and our brother? You are your brother's keeper and your sister's keeper. Some of our young people are struggling desperately with life. They may look at you or look at me, and they may think wrongly that we have grown up in a world without any hardships, without fears, without discouragements, without any disappointments or betrayal by friends. They need us to share authentic experience with them. And now may be the time to pull back the veil of privacy on your own life journey and admit some of the things that you've had to cope with in life and what it is like to be you. You may find that you're offering them encouragement of a type that they never get anywhere else. I would like to pursue this thought a little farther. If you have your finger on the pulse of society these days, you already know how many beautiful young people think they just can't cope. They've been lied to about life by how it's portrayed in media. And when they're faced by things that appear impossible, they imagine that there's something wrong with them. After all, everyone else seems to live in a near perfect world. And so they immerse themselves sometimes in alcohol and that doesn't provide the answer they're looking for. And then they may try drugs of one kind or another, just a dead end street. Sadly, I've spoken with my share of parents who have had to lay to rest the remains of a son or a daughter who found it all just too much to handle. Many of our youth may think that they are the only ones who have had to struggle with life. As they look at you or me, they may think wrongly that we never had have had hassles or trials or misunderstandings to deal with. It may seem that we have never had any financial woes or no bad habits or vices to overcome, no health issues to navigate, no troubled relationships to resolve. They may think we have had no failures in life to get over and no worries to plague us and never doubted in ourselves and our abilities and our future and, of course, never had a time of doubt about God and about eternity. So it may be urgently needed for you and me to pull back that veil of privacy and to share the real you with others who are struggling, to be able to say, I don't have it all together all the time. If you have ever had personal doubts in yourself and how you've coped, you've got something to share. And if your faith has ever been weak or fragmented, 
to tell what you did about it would be so helpful. And how have you coped with the giants of loneliness and hopelessness, depression and despair? They need to hear that. How you have navigated the troubled waters of financial stress and how to be strong when faced with stressors in marriage and in raising a family. You see, to share authentic experience with them may be worth more than the finest gold. Just make sure that everything you share is yours to do so and doesn't implicate or suggest private and personal information that belongs to someone else who alone has the right to give or to withhold it. Now for our closing benediction. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Mm -hmm.